yesterday we were dealing with um, uh, the various stages on practice in order to recognize the um, original nature of the mind. Of course, um, this was a very quick overview and um, in fact there are a few stages in between which we didn't mention. But uh, in general, the, the focus, the aim or aspiration of, um, of Vajrayana in general, the tantric approach, and in, in particular Mahamudra and Dzogchen, is to gain a direct realization of the nature of the mind. And so, as a reminder, the nature of the mind is our pure primordial awareness, which by its very nature is non-dualistic. Non-dualistic means that there is no sense of I and other, there's no sense of subject and object. We, we recognize deeply without having to think about it. It just naturally, see, we realize the interconnection of all beings and there's no sense of, um, you know, standing back self and other in that level of awareness, uh, which is why it is uh, compared to space or the sky, because we cannot uh, divide space. It, it's not something which we can put into little blocks and say, this is my little space and that's your space. Space interpenetrates everywhere. And at the same time, space is not something which we can own in the sense that we cannot grasp it, we cannot see it. I mean, there are many experiences in meditation which are very colorful, like experiences of bliss and clarity and non-conceptuality and so forth, which we can pinpoint as something. It has a, a kind of emotional flavor to it. But the nature of the mind is beyond all that. And, and so therefore it, it could even be missed because we expect that the ultimate reality will be especially colorful. And um, the fact that it's, it's like space, which it has no color at all, no taste, no sound, um, could be disappointing. But in fact, it's, it's a, as I said yesterday, it, it, it's accompanied by a sense of waking up. Waking up from our dream of illusion, which we are all trapped in. And so it's accompanied by a tremendous sense of relief. Ah. In the early uh, Theravadin text, it was compared with laying down the burden. Like if we're carrying a rucksack, a backpack of rocks up the mountain, our ego, our I, which needs to be made happy and protected from suffering and always me, 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 always. And then suddenly, this very heavy burden, which we're not even, we're so used to carrying it, we don't even recognize what we're carrying and how it weighs us down. But when we let it go, oh, we have that sense of inner freedom, liberation, lightness. What a relief. And, and so it's, it's like that. It's not that we gain anything. It's that we drop a whole lot. We, we let go of everything. And then there is that open sense of freedom. Which is why when we meet with the great masters, not necessarily Buddhist masters, masters of any tradition, genuine masters, their eyes are shining, sparkling. 
because they're free. So, the moment we're all trapped in the prison house of samsara, but there are ways out. And one of these ways is this um, practice of allowing the mind to be very relaxed and spacious, but at the same time extremely focused. And really beginning to understand first the nature of our conceptual thinking mind. After shamatha comes vipassana, where we start to question the mind. Where do thoughts come from? What is a thought? Where does it start? Where does it stay? Where does it go to? What color is it? Who is thinking? And so the Vipassana side of Mahamudra, again, um, we, we have to uh, use our analysis to look at it. So some people, of course, when they go into shamatha, they, they're very happy with shamatha because when you're doing shamatha, the mind becomes very peaceful and very settled and it's a very pleasant, usually a very pleasant experience once one becomes accustomed to it. People uh, even go into deep levels of um, mental absorption in which they, all the outer senses um, go into abeyance, they, they are no longer functioning and there's just the inner brilliance of the mind. And so of course this is often very uh, alluring and attractive to people and they don't want to go back into a more um, analytical way of thinking. For example, um, how much have we got to get through? I, mean, I go off into stories and it takes up so much time. But anyway, as an example, um, my, my first meditation teacher was this old yogi called uh, Thokton Chulek Rinpoche. And so I was studying uh, uh, Mahamudra under his direction at that time. And he told me about um, a, a student of his in Tibet who was a layman uh, he was a businessman, but he was very good at shamatha meditation. And uh, the yogi, the Tokden, said to him, now you, you stop shamatha, you have to go into vipassana, you can't get stuck there. But he didn't want to, because shamatha is very pleasant. And, and you know, to have to bring back the ordinary conceptual thinking mind again and ask questions felt like a disturbance. So anyway, um, one time this businessman with his friends, uh, they did trading in China. And in those days, there were big forests between uh, eastern Tibet and China. And so they were going through the forest and they camped for the night. And uh, his friends said, go off and collect some wood uh, for, you know, we'll make... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll make the tea and then collect some wood for the meal. So he went off to collect the wood. And then while he was collecting wood, he thought, oh, well, I'll just sit down and meditate for a few minutes. So he sat down uh, to meditate. And then meantime, his friends were wondering where he'd got to. And uh, time went by. And so then they went out looking for him and calling him and nothing. And then what could they do? They went, they stayed the night and next morning again they looked for him and called him and he didn't reply and they figured he had gotten attacked by some wild animal or something, what had happened to him. So eventually they couldn't find him anywhere so they went on to China. And then they finished their trading in China and uh, a year later they were returning to Tibet and they got to the same place again and thought, well, at least we can find some clothing or some bones to take back to his family. And so they again looked and there he was sitting under a tree. This is a true story. Uh, he was sitting under a tree, so then they went up to him and said, hey, Norbu, you know, and he opened his eyes and said, 
Oh, is the tea ready yet? And so when they told him that he had just spent a year sitting there under the tree, he was very frightened. And he recognized he just wasted a year of his life. And after that, they talked and said he was very anxious to do Vipassana. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the point is that shamatha is very good. It makes the mind very, it makes the mind workable. It makes the mind supple, flexible, able to be trained. But in itself, it's a dead end, right? So after shamatha comes this insight into the nature of the mind, how the nature of the mind works. But by that time, the mind is, is capable of undertaking the analysis because the mind now is in a good state, it's clear, it's um, flexible, workable, we can use it. It's like dough, you know, I mean like if you're making a, a, a ceramics, you know, first you have to knead the dough and make it so it's soft, so that then we can mold it in, into the shape we want it to go to. While it's hard and intractable, we can't do anything with it. So shamatha is to make the mind into the kind of um, mental consciousness which we can then work with and is, an, is amenable to being trained, is amenable to gathering insight and, and uncovering deeper and deeper layers of our consciousness till there is a total shift in the consciousness from our ordinary dualistic to the non-dualistic level of our awareness. It's a whole shift. So, stage by stage. Once you have recognized, we're on page 16, second paragraph, Once you have recognized the stark, clear awareness that transcends dualistic mind and is absolutely uninfluenced by thoughts of the three times, three times past, present, future, keep it always present through mindfulness with or without effort. Thus, go about your daily activities without desire or clinging. The essential teaching expounded from many points of view in all the sutras, tantras, and profound ways is none other than the means of seeing the naked, empty awareness, the real face of ultimate nature. Therefore, exert yourself unremittingly in this. So the most essential practice is to maintain this pure awareness at all times. If you can do that, that's it. <laughs> so, we start from where we are. And so, for this reason, the Buddha recommended first we practice being mindful. Mindful means we are aware. It's still a dualistic awareness, as I said yesterday. There is subject and object. It's not pure primordial awareness. It's just a, a level of our consciousness which is able to look and observe what is happening in the mind or what is happening in the body or what is happening outside of ourselves. It's this ability to witness and observe. This is not ultimate reality, but it's very, very useful. Because normally we are not aware, we are not mindful. We just get caught up in all sorts of wandering thoughts and distractions so that we are doing one thing, thinking another, or even if we are thinking our mind is very undirected and we're not even conscious 
of what we're thinking or what we're feeling until it overwhelms us. So this ability to be more mindful has, I mean, it's ironic that nowadays it's also being appreciated, you know, in the secular world, in big businesses, you know, uh, Organizations like Google and others run whole mindfulness programs for their staff. Uh, it makes us more efficient, less stress-free, less likely to burn out, and so therefore highly useful. Has nothing in their mind to do with waking up and becoming enlightened, but if it does help people to become more balanced, more centered, less stressed, more relaxed, it's a good thing. Recently, I saw an advertisement in uh, Time magazine. They have published a book which is entitled Mindfulness, the New Science of the Mind. The West has discovered it, so it's new. <laughs> but, you know, whatever uses it is put to... Of course, I mean, some um, Buddhist teachers object to this because they say that in Buddhism, it's not just mindfulness, it's right mindfulness, which means that it's an awareness accompanied by wholesome states of thought. And if they are not accompanied by wholesome states of thought, it's not right mindfulness from a Buddhist perspective. But my feeling is that anything which helps people to um, you know, lead a less stressed life, to learn how to give more attention to what is happening and to be more relaxed and at ease within themselves, more centered, is a good thing. It doesn't really matter what the label is on the package. And uh, so, therefore, it's very interesting. Psychiatrists, likewise, have uh, discovered the great uses of um, mindfulness. And so this is now a big, um, you know, uh, emphasis in psychological circles that how often mindfulness helps in a way that um, the psychiatric medicines often do not. And also now, mindfulness more and more is being taught in schools, in hospitals, in prisons, in the military. Do you teach it in the military here? There, they should start. Um, you know, so you aim properly. Um, but anyway, and I mean, the point is that the, the actual realization that to have a relaxed and focused mind is beneficial is something which is now becoming more and more appreciated. And of course in Buddhist practice it's essential in all Buddhist schools, Theravada, Zen, Tibetan, everybody recognizes the importance of, of mindfulness and the um, accompanying uh, quality of mind, which in Tibetan is called Zhejin, which is this aspect of the mind in English, it's translated in many ways, we don't have an English equivalent. Introspection, vigilance, um, knowing, clear comprehension. It's this aspect of the mind which pops up and looks and sees at this moment, what is happening in the mind? And if the mind is clear and centered and mindful, it goes back again. If there's any problem, we're distracted or we're, we're sleepy and sluggish, then it brings, uh, you know, it allows us to notice what's going on in the mind and to rectify it because often we forget what is happening in our mind and especially in meditation what is the state of our mind is our mind sinking or is it becoming agitated then once we recognize that we can deal with the, the problem so these two go together in uh, Tibetan is called Drenshe 
um, Trimpa is, is this mindfulness and, and Shexin is this ability to overlook from time to time and see that everything is on track nicely. But during the day also we need to try to really practice being more conscious. And so therefore he is saying that um, once you have recognized the stark clear, once we have recognized the primordial nature of the mind, the rest of the practice is just learning how to cultivate that. Uh, Kamta Rinpoche himself said to me that once you recognize the nature of the mind, then you start to meditate. Right? Because real meditation is learning how to recognize the nature of the mind and then more and more um, able to access that level of consciousness. The main problem with that is that if we want it, we won't get it. You know, I mean, this is always a problem in meditation. That on the one hand we have to practice, but on the other hand we, haven't, we mustn't want any gain from the practice. Because as soon as we want some gain from the practice, it closes the door to that. So many people, when they first start to meditate, maybe their very first session, because they have no prior, um, what's the word? They, they, they don't have any concepts about what's going to happen. They read, all oh, right, you have to sit and look at your breath, so they just sit and look at their breath. Okay, what? And so their mind, therefore, is without any preconceptions and is very relaxed. And as a result, all the factors come together and they get some great experience. Many, many people relate to this. They get some real, real genuine experience. But then, you see, then the mind, the ego says, wow, that was great, let's get that again. And as soon as we think like that, of course, it won't come. And, and so this is likewise very true for recognizing the nature of the mind. It's not so difficult to get a glimpse. But once we want to get a glimpse, that's it, you know, we won't get it. And at the same time, we have to work towards getting a glimpse. You know? So it's, it's this very um, challenging situation in which to know, as I say, this is why I'm saying, Set the GPS and then relax and just watch what's happening and not worrying about the direction. Because if we're only focusing on what we want to happen, it will never happen. So we create the causes and conditions and then relax and as it comes, it will come without any hopes or fears. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's a very important in meditation that we don't become goal-orientated. Because that, again, who wants to get these experiences? The ego does. But the ego can never realize the nature of the mind because the nature of the mind is the egoless state. So the ego can never be realized. The ego can want to be realized. Now I'm a nice, realized little ego. But it, it never can happen. So it only can happen when our sense of self just dissolves. Then another whole level of awareness arises, which is always there, but normally is covered by the clouds of our egoic uh, conceptual thinking mind. So, he's saying that if you have had direct contact with the nature of the mind, that the real practice is to try to contact that, that again and again, which mostly comes through learning how to relax the mind, how to make the mind very spacious, not, you know, tight and I've got to realize the nature of the mind. That's never going to do it. We have to learn how to relax the mind and just be aware. 
once that we have developed, I mean, you know, and great practitioners are in that state the whole time. Uh, so it's not impossible because it's, it's our true nature. So once we have realized that, which transcends our dualistic mind of self and others, and it's absolutely uninfluenced by any of our thinking. It doesn't mean that we stop thinking. We can think. Thinking is a wonderful tool. When we need to think, we can think. In fact, our mind will be much more clear, much more creative, much more um, workable. But we are not influenced by it. We see thoughts as thoughts, and those thoughts which are useful, we cultivate. Those thoughts which are not useful, we can put aside. Because we're not swept along by the thoughts anymore. We just see thoughts as thoughts. So we're absolutely uninfluenced by thought, our memories. Thoughts of three times means all our memories our opinions about what's happening now, our dreams and fantasies and plans for the future, all our thoughts of the three times, past, present and future, doesn't affect our essential awareness. We just observe it like watching a movie. And always, so keeping it present through mindfulness, so we have to maintain that ability to be aware. And even if we are not in non-dual pure awareness, we can cultivate ordinary mindfulness. That is a preparation for an even deeper level of our consciousness. It's very helpful to be mindful. That we can all do. Uh, with or without effort. So people who really are in a state of rikpa the whole time, it's totally effortless. And even those who have cultivated mindfulness very well, they don't have to try, they naturally are aware. But for the rest of us, we have to make some effort. We have to remind ourselves. Actually, the word trempa or shmirti, sati, means to remember. So what we have to do is endlessly remind ourselves to be mindful. So in the beginning, we have to make efforts. Uh, but as with any skill, once we keep trying, practicing, 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 eventually it becomes effortless, like learning to play a musical instrument or learning a sport or anything. Beginning, we have to make a lot of effort, but eventually, uh, you know, our, the skill becomes part of who we are and then it, it just flows. So likewise with mindfulness, in the beginning we have to really, really work at being mindful. But eventually the mind learns these new patterns, the how to be in that level of consciousness that becomes predominant. And then it, it seems like effortless. We don't have to keep reminding ourselves. We are naturally going to be mindful. This is why, in, when, uh, especially in Theravadan countries, when they do uh, retreats, when people do retreats, there's a lot of emphasis, also in Zen, I think, a lot of emphasis on physical movement and being very aware of our physical movement you know, whatever we're doing when we're walking or when we're sitting or when we're sweeping or when we're washing dishes or whatever, eating, anything we do to slow it down a little so that we are conscious of what we are doing and our mind isn't flying all over in all directions and through the three times, but is settled where we are. This is a great relief for the mind. Ah, oh, that it just can be with what is actually happening. Instead of being all over everywhere except where it's happening. 
So this is, as I say, why mindfulness has become the buzzword in, in big business nowadays, because they have discovered that actually it's very healthy for the mind to learn how to be present with what is happening, instead of endlessly chattering away to itself, mostly total irrelevances. So, thus go about your daily activities without desire or clinging. You know, our mind tends, somebody once said it was like, it has little hooks and it whirls around and catches onto everything. It's, it's like Velcro. You know, anything that comes near Velcro catches onto it. And that is like our mind. Our mind sees something vaguely attractive and it catches. And because it has these little hooks. So what we need to do is to retract these hooks. Have a, a Teflon mind, right? <laughs> Things don't stick. A non-stick mind. That's what we need. Then whatever we see, we can appreciate, but we don't, we don't catch on to it. You know, it's, it's very important, this, because our mind... The Buddha said that the, the cause of our suffering, our dukkha, is this grasping mind, this clinging mind, which catches on to things. That is what causes us suffering, not the things themselves, but the fact that we catch on and we can't let go. And since everything is impermanent and we have to let go, we suffer. So therefore, in a state of awareness, even in a state of mindfulness, also ordinary conceptual mindfulness, there's a sense of space. We're not right up against it. We can see things, see people, see situations, appreciate or not, but we, there's a space there. Even also in our mind, there is a space. The thoughts come out of space, they go back into space. Normally we see the thoughts, we don't recognize the space. Like clouds. We see the clouds, we don't see the sky from which the clouds emerge. But the sky is there always, and the, there would be no clouds if there was not the sky. The clouds come from the sky, they go back into the sky, where else would they go? But we get fixated on the clouds, and we don't see the sky. So that is exactly like our mind. We get caught up in all our thoughts and feelings, we don't see the space. And therefore we catch. But where there is space, then there is openness. Things appear, and then they go. So, therefore, Rinpoche says, let's go about your daily activities without desire and clinging. One of the things about come to Rinpoche was that whatever happened, he never overreacted. Um, I mean, when something really awful happened, like somebody who was very dear, um, died or some, you know, really bad thing happened, he would just say, oh yes. And uh, I remember that our community, which was living up in the mountains in Himachal Pradesh in Dalhousie, um, the Indian government wanted to move all the Tibetans from these border regions and send them down. So most uh, Tibetans were sent down to South India where they still are. Um, and we were being sent to a place called Madhya Pradesh, which is uh, 
next to a hell realm, essentially. It's very hot, it was very jungly. It's really one of the most difficult states of India. And um, so we were not very happy about going to Madhya Pradesh. Um, and then we, we got a message uh, that we would, after all, not have to go to Madhya Pradesh. We could stay in Himachal Pradesh and, and we were eventually we went to Tashijong, where we are now. So I remember um, Chulia Rinpoche, who was my teacher, he uh, got this letter from the government saying, oh, we were not going to go to Himachal Pradesh, we could stay in him, uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, we could stay in Himachal Pradesh. So we were so excited and we hugged each other and jumped up and down and up and down. We were really pleased about that. And then we rushed to Rinpoche, who was drawing as usual, and uh, told him, you know, wow, Rinpoche, you know, we don't have to go to Madhya Pradesh, we're in Himacho. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Chujal and I looked at each other, <laughs> all right. Yeah, so Rinpoche was, um, you yeah, know, he was always friendly and sweet and loving, but he, he didn't go up with the good news and down with the bad news. He was very equanimous. And I, I always felt with him that even if the sky fell down, Rinpoche would deal with it. It was all right, because he had this, he was like a mountain. I always thought he was like Mount Sumeru, unshakable. Always very sweet, always very kind, gentle, but never, never, he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't a volcano. He was a very stable mountain. So, like that, that we don't go through um, enormous amounts of ups and downs because our, our mindfulness and our awareness is sees the open spaciousness where thunder clouds come up, rainbows come up, all kinds of sunshine and showers, but there is the sky, the space, to contain it all. So, the essential teaching expanded from many points of view in all the sutras, tantras and profound ways is none other than the means of seeing the naked, empty awareness, which is the real face of the ultimate nature. So all of these teachings are to get us back to our original awareness, our primordial nature of the mind, which, as I say, is like a shift in consciousness. It's not more of mindfulness, it's a whole different level. Therefore, exert yourselves unremittingly in this. So this is what we have to do. We have, first we start with what we're starting with. You know, we start with watching the breath, then when we have uh, the ability to be mindful of that and not to get too distracted, but to keep our, our attention on the breath going in and out or whatever is our focus of meditation. Then from that we turn it to the mind itself. We start watching the mind until the mind become, we begin to see the mind and then we examine the mind and then we examine our awareness by dropping the mind and just being aware of being aware. And then likewise, uh, gradually we go back to getting a glimpse of the underlying nature of the mind. And then we start the real meditation, which is to cultivate the ability to stay in the nature of the mind, eventually at all times, 24 hours a day, even in sleep, which the, the great practitioners can do. At the end of your practice session, dedicate all the merit of yourself and others for the attainment of supreme enlightenment for the sake of all beings, just as all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of all times have done. So it's very important uh, whenever we, um, we ourselves um, cultivate uh, something which is regarded as being uh, good karma, positive, wholesome actions, or we see others 
likewise doing that. If we see other people doing uh, actions of kindness or generosity and so forth, we can rejoice in what they are doing and dedicate, again, the merit for all beings. The world needs, the world is desperately in need of good, positive energy. Truly. We talk a lot about ecological pollution. And there are photos taken from space over certain cities showing the deep level of pollution which is surrounding those particular areas and probably more and more surrounding the whole globe. But what about our spiritual pollution? the psychic pollution, of all the negative thoughts and emotions which are sent out into the world. Our thoughts have power, our thoughts have energy. I mean, if one goes to a place which is a very sacred place, which has maybe for centuries and centuries been the object of people's devotion, you can feel the energy there the positive energy. It, it's something almost tangible. Even you don't know what that place is. And likewise, if we go to a place which has had very negative energy, I mean, for example, you know, if you go to somewhere like Auschwitz, we don't need to know what happened in Auschwitz to know that something awful happened. There is a, a real sense of deep darkness in the atmosphere, even though if those of you who have visited Auschwitz will know there's really not much to see, you know, there's just big rooms. And yet one knows that this was a place of deep grief. It's still there. And because also the people who come are coming in grief. So we can feel it. Our thoughts are almost tangible. And so if we think of the thoughts of us humans especially on this planet right now, they're pretty dark. There's a lot of, of greed, of anger and aggression, of fear, of jealousy, competitiveness, all that creates this, this shroud of darkness around our planet. Even our entertainment is dark. The, the things we watch, the movies and the television, it's all either about making us more greedy or more aggressive. And so we need to counterbalance that because people feed on that dark energy. And so one of the ways to help bring light into all this dark, heavy energy surrounding our globe is through loving kindness and compassion meditation surrounding the globe with light and also dedication of wholesomeness, of goodness and a rejoicing in goodness and dedicating that out to all beings. This all helps all our prayers, if they are not self-centered, but if they are really intended for all beings, all beings, are good. And they, they help to lighten the darkness. I mean, truly, our thoughts have a power. We shouldn't underestimate. And especially when people come together, people have always known that our, our psychic energy is increased when we are together praying for something together. This is why ritual has become so important in all religions, because it, it creates a power and a force for good. And we need that. The world needs that. 
So therefore, at the end of any practice session or any time anything good has happens, that even if we ourselves have not done it, if we rejoice in it being done, that's enough. Um, you know, there, there is a story of the uh, Buddha being invited with his monks for lunch by a big uh, benefactor who uh, made a very lavish lunch and then invited all the neighbors in to look and see how generous he was. And, uh, you know, I was very pleased with himself. Look, I've got the Buddha himself here with all his monks and look what an incredible meal I'm offering them. <sighs> and so at the end of the meal, there was an old beggar woman who was also standing in the doorway and she was so happy that this businessman was making so much merit and, and offering to the Buddha such beautiful food and she was just, just so happy for them. And at the end of the meal, the Buddha said, well, who should we dedicate the merit to? Should we dedicate the merit, uh, you know, to the person whose aspirations for, for goodness and generosity are the greatest, or what? And, of course, the businessman considered that he was the one with the greatest aspirations since he was the one that offered the lunch. So he said, yes, of course you should do that, whoever is the most pure um, generosity. And so the Buddha said, okay, of course, I, I offered this to the beggar woman. It's her merit. Because she was rejoicing, purely. She wasn't getting anything out of it. Her delight in someone else's generosity was so genuine that hers was the most pure merit for that day. And so we, even if we can't do anything ourselves, if we hear, read, see someone doing something good, we can rejoice in that goodness. And that also is very powerful, and then dedicate that. So it's a win-win situation. And we shouldn't just focus on what is wrong in the world because there's so much goodness. So, anyway, so therefore, um, and just as all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of all times have dedicated, uh, merit means positive actions. It means anything which we do which it has, uh, is, is um, connected with positive states of mind, of, of kindness, of, of compassion, of generosity, of patience, all these positive states of mind conjoined with our actions create merit. So, do this where the three spheres, your self-sentient beings and merit to be distributed, are not conceptualized. Well, if you can, do. Um, this is uh, the union of uh, of what's called skillful means, that means the actions which you are doing which are positive, along with wisdom. The idea being that normally when we do an action, uh, it is caught in, in three false conceptions. Uh, if I am going to give uh, say this water to somebody because they're thirsty, then I give the water to that person because they're thirsty and they are grateful and that's nice and it's very, um, you know, it's a good action. We're being generous and we're, we're helping somebody. But although it creates positive karma, it, it's a positive action, it is nonetheless still court in three false conceptions. First, that I am an individual autonomous being making a gift to another truly existent autonomous being. So therefore, that in itself, the fact that we are not what we think we are, the autonomous, solid, enduring, entities 
totally independent of other entities. That is a false conception. And so, therefore, by acting, all our actions, if they are done with this false conception, although it creates nonetheless meritorious karma, it doesn't increase our wisdom. And so it doesn't help towards liberation. Do you understand? So if one is giving in a state of primordial awareness, our true nature, then there is no sense of self, other, or uh, any action happening between the two. It's all just open display. And in that case, we are not caught. And in that case, our action not only increases our merit bank, but also uh, develops our uh, inherent wisdom. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Just be generous. Then, without just mechanically repeating them, now this is important, without mechanically repeating them, make prayers of aspirations that you may be able to engage in even a fraction of the deeds and liberating lifestyles of the Buddhas and their spiritual sons, spiritual sons means bodhisattvas, and all the great saints and teachers of the past. So, um, the important thing is that whatever we do, especially in our practice, we should really, as much as possible, give it our full attention and not just, um, for example, if one is reciting mantras, that one should uh, really give attention to the mantras and not just automatically repeat it with the mind going off in all other directions. In the uh, commentaries on practice, it, it very emphatically uh, states that we can recite mantras for a hundred eons, but if we do it with a distracted mind, then um, we will get very little results. Whereas if we put our attention onto what we are doing, then very quickly results will come. Our mind has to merge with the action, the meditation. You know, because sometimes it's like our mind is here, the meditation is there, and they're trying to come together. We have to really merge, so we become the meditation. Then very quickly the results come. But if we're saying mantras, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, I wonder what we're having for lunch, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, money. why did she say that? She had a very peculiar look. I wonder if, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby. I mean, it's useless. Whereas if we are saying, oh, money, pay me home, and we are clearly aware of what we're saying and the visualization we're supposed to accompany that and our mind and the, the object of the meditation become one, very quickly it affects a change because we are able to access a deeper level of our consciousness. This is what Vajrayana is about. But only if we really become one with the practice, otherwise it doesn't work. You know, we tone up millions and millions of mantras and practices and how many wongs we've had and how much teaching from this one and that one and the other. Mind stays the same. Same old mind. Same old reactions. We have to transform from inside and we only can transform from inside when we really become one with our practice. This is why shamatha is so useful. In the old days, and this is for the Buddhists amongst you who are into Vajrayana, uh, in the old days, you, you start by doing what is called the preliminary practices of mundro. And then after you've done several mundros, usually, I mean, they, they, 
you know, usually in Tibet, of course, where people had endless time, then they, they did many, many mundras. Uh, then you would do shamatha and vipassana and all this. But now the lamas are recognizing that because our minds are so totally distracted, even if people do do the ngundro, it's with a very distracted mind, and it's not really getting the effect it's meant to have. So now the lamas are suggesting that we start with shamatha, get the mind quietened down and attentive and, and flexible, workable, supple, then do ngundro, and then go back to doing shamatha again. So the whole point is that we've got to work with our mind and, and make our mind so that it really becomes one with our practice. Then very quickly results come. Otherwise we can do it the whole life and at the end we think, well, what was that all about? So it's good not to skip stages to go up one after the other after the other. And the first is to learn how to make our mind attentive and quieter and, and more knowing, more aware. So, he says, then without mechanically repeating them, um, make our prayers of aspiration or also, this is for dedication, right? So at the end of dedicating in the Tibetan tradition, they do a lot of what are called monlam, or prayers of dedication. But again, we have to think what we're saying. I mean, I, I see this in our nunnery. Our nuns can zap through their, their monlams at an, a great speed. But I wonder what they, they know what they're saying, you know, because they've memorized it all. So, and, and their, their belief is that just by saying it, it's enough. But if you read the text, they all say just saying it is not enough. We, we have to engage our mind in what we're saying. It's no good. I mean, the prayers of themselves have some efficacy, but nothing compared with if we're actually knowing what we're saying. Which again is the excuse against everybody reciting prayers like in Tibetan, if you're not Tibetan. I mean, it's good that you're saying your prayers in Hebrew. So at least you know what you're saying. So it's, it's very easy, especially in a, a language like Tibetan, where people can, um, because of the way it's written, it's very easy to memorize and just roll it off. And, and kind of like your mind goes to sleep or else the mind is all over the place and you're just, the mouth is going blah, 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 very fast. And that's not really very useful, but I can't argue with the nuns. That's how they do it. That's how the monks do it. You see, this is the problem. This is how the monks do it. So if you're really efficient, you do it like the monks. It's all your fault. Um, so anyway, this, this is, but Rinpoche is saying, don't do that like that. You know, you should um, really try to think of what you're saying and, and do it properly. Carry out your practice observing the three instructions including preparation, main body, and conclusion of the prayer. So they have a little nice little note at the back here about that. The three instructions on page 10 is preparation. That means to set one's motivation towards it. That's your GPS, right? You set your GPS towards Buddhahood for the sake of all beings. Then that's enough. You've done that. Then the main body is to carry out one's practice mindfully without distraction and in a non-conceptual state if you can manage it. If you know how to be in a non-conceptual state, then that's very best. If you don't, doesn't matter. Be as undistracted as possible. That's enough. During our practice, we really have to say to our mind, look mind, behave yourself. You know, stop messing around. You've kept me in samsara for how long? Look, now please cooperate. 
And so that's why we start with the preparation, which is the reminder that we are doing this practice in order to gain some understanding, in order to be of help to others. So it's, it's a very... Uh, it's a responsibility. You've made a promise to all sentient beings. You're going to help them. So how can we not do... How can we be distracted? We've already made this big promise to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and all sentient beings. I'm going to really practice for your sake, sentient beings. And then if we don't do that, then we've let down everybody. So it's not good enough. So, we have to carry out our practice mindfully, without distraction. If we know how to be in a state of rikpa, of non-conceptuality, then that's very best. If not, don't worry about it. Just be non-distracted. <laughs> and in the conclusion, we distribute the merit to all beings for the attainment of enlightenment. Right? So that's very straightforward. Um, I have problems because we are, it goes backwards. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, carry out the practice, observing these three instructions about motivation, non-distraction, and then dedication in a complete form without allowing it to become sloppy. Because as we keep doing things again and again, we, our ability to really be, you know, really attentive and careful and do it from our heart can, sometimes it becomes routine, you know, and, and so then we, we don't give it the, the attention and the, the care that we should give it. And, and so for that reason, we, we have to be very careful and, and not become sloppy, not become careless, just going through it. Especially, I would say, the, the danger is particularly with the, the Vajrayana, because, you know, we have the sadhana of the deity. And, uh, you know, if you repeat it every day, then pretty soon you've got it by heart. And... Uh, uh, especially for those who have been taught by their teachers to do it in Tibetan, if they're not Tibetans, it's very easy just to go brrrr, and your mind is off somewhere else. And so, you know, we really have to be strict with ourselves about this. Do it in your own language. Read the commentaries really understand what you're supposed to be seeing, have a picture there so you know what you're supposed to be visualizing, and, and really from the heart try to immerse in the practice properly and not just let it become, you know, just um, sloppy, as they say. I mean, that, that we just go through it and we recite the mantras and we do all the mudras and it all looks very lovely on the outside, inside what's happening. So we have to, you know, this is also a form of shamatha because either we, um, we do a practice where we are, uh, what can I say? We are counseling, counseling or the various discursive thinking and to get it down to one point. Right, so we are visualizing the breath, we're looking at the breath, or we're looking at a pebble, or we're looking at the mind, but it's, we're focusing it narrowly. Or in the Vajrayana, because there is all this visualization, deities, lights coming in, lights going out, mantras, and so forth, there's so much to think about that the mind doesn't have the chance to get distracted. Right? It, it's filled up with dealing with all these arms and heads and, and lights. So in this way, it's another way of dealing with how to let the mind be non-distracted. We're so busy keeping all these elements going 
that we have no time to think about what's for dinner. We, we are just caught up in, in uh, you know, keeping everything on, on track. And so this is why, again, it's important to, to really try to fill the mind with these, these uh, visualizations and, and not just, um, you know, just recite the words but not make an effort to carry out what the words are telling us to do. Because always the, the, the words are an instruction of what we're supposed to be visualizing along with the prayers and the mantras. So if we listen to what we're saying and we try to visualize that, then that occupies the mind. And in this way, the mind also is trained. So Tibetans like to do both they find one side upholds the other. Uh, so then, uh, through these three points, it is very important to make any virtuous action you perform significant, whether corresponding to the accumulation of merit, wisdom, or both in union. So this accumulation of merit and wisdom is, as I said, if when we do a meritorious action, if we can do it in a, a level of non-conceptuality of uh, subject, object, and action, then that also accumulates wisdom. But even if we can't do that, we can at least accumulate merit. If one has acquired mastery over the unity of appearances and mind, if, in other words, we are always in a state of primordial awareness, it makes no difference where one remains in retreat. So, whether we are in the marketplace or wherever we are up in a cave, it's all the same because everything is just uh, a projection of our primordial awareness. Beginners, however, Ha ha. Should stay in a mountain hermitage. So off you go. <laughs> in a retreat place endowed with great blessings. It should be congenial and pleasant where necessities are easily available. It should be isolated from the hustle and bustle of the world and devoid of bad companions, such as vicious people and people with wrong views. Your dwelling, friends, household things, and possessions should be sufficient, however simple they may be. There is no need for further paraphernalia. You should possess the wealth of contentment. So, I assume after our evening session you are not all going to rush off to Mount Sinai and uh, sit in a cave there, contemplating. It would be very nice, you have this vast open sky. But if you don't do that, never mind. The Buddha said we should develop a cave and forest mind, right? So that wherever we go, we keep our cave and forest mind. That means a mind which is inwardly spacious and quiet. Even if outwardly there is a hustle and bustle, inwardly there is the inner silence of awareness. So in order to cultivate that, it does help to do some retreats. There's no doubt. If we want to learn any skill, we need to have protected time in which to develop that skill. Then we can take it with us into our daily life. It is, doesn't mean you have to go into retreat for a hundred years. But at least some basic guidance is very helpful. And a well-run retreat, even if it's short, even if it's only a weekend or a week or three weeks, if one is able to get even a hint, 
that one's mind actually can do this, it is very, very beneficial. Because a lot of people, as he's saying back here, think I am weak and stupid and I can't do anything. And so when we sit down for 10 minutes to try to meditate and the mind is all over the place and then we convince ourselves we can't do it. So it's very helpful to be in a conducive environment where everything is there, like in a well-run retreat center where the f you don't have to think about food, you don't have to think about you know, where you're going to stay, you don't have to think about anything. All you have to do is turn up for the sessions. And you're guided. And there, there is the group energy. Or even if you're by yourself, at least you're still being held by the teacher. And I, this is enormously important. I mean, I know that some of you might not be able to manage it. But those of you who can really should because it's enormous boost to our confidence that we actually can practice. And for many people, especially in, in the West, the, the big hindrance is that we don't believe we can do it. So once we have even a taste, yes, we can. Hey, look, wow. For a whole two minutes, I was attentive. You know, two minutes is two minutes. Said the average attention span of a child in the USA nowadays is four seconds. Two minutes is a long time. So, we have to believe in ourselves. We have to believe in our own potential to awaken. And, and the best way to do this is, is to undergo a well-run retreat, however long, however short, and just get some taste of that to help us to understand, I also can do. Why not? So, of course, in Tibet, there's all this talk of, you know, going off into the mountains and da-da-da, but even in the modern day and age, there are still opportunities. We don't have to, there's nothing magical about a cave. All we need is a conducive environment, simple but adequate, to cultivate contentment with little, And just to have the opportunity to relax and dedicate our whole attention to the practice without any other outer worries. It's very, very helpful, really, really. So all of you who have the opportunity should really look into it, you know, and, and really think about how to um, bring this about because it, it's very, very beneficial. As with any skill, we need to have good teachers and we need to have the opportunity to develop that skill. Do not associate with bad companions who pretend to be religious but are accustomed to behaving without dharma and have an immoral outlook. So, the Buddha emphasize very much the importance of good friends. Good friends means those who share our spiritual values. It doesn't matter what religion or non-religion they belong to. They are essentially good people. And in that way, they inspire us to our own goodness and they encourage the goodness within us. We can admire them, and at the same time, it, as I say, it encourages us to emulate them. So, therefore, the, the importance of good friends cannot be um, overemphasized. 
there, there is a passage in the, in the Buddhist text where Ananda, who was the Buddha's cousin and his assistant, he says to the Buddha, you know, I've been thinking about it, and I think that good companionship is half the spiritual path. And the Buddha said, no, Ananda, it's the whole of the spiritual path. So, we seek good companionship and we seek to be good companions to others, right? Because we all need inspiration from each other. So, to be careful, you know, some people are outwardly very religious, but it's just the ego trying to look at me, I'm so pious, I don't eat this on those days and I do this and I do that. It's all out to show. Now, it might be also the, um, you know, the, the position of their inner mind that they are truly trying to you know, be a, a spiritual person from inside out. But it's very easy for people to be out and not have much going on in, except their own ego about how spiritual they are. So, to be careful. I mean, this happens in, in all religious circles, that people um, put on a show of being very, very religious and special. But inside, their, their minds are still caught up in their egoistic um, greed and pride and envy and, and so on. And in that case, we might be... Um, you know, follow a wrong track. We really should be very, very careful about the company we keep, in other words. And, and really be careful to only associate with good friends, good meaning from the inside, very good heart. So, we don't want someone to lead us astray, in other words. You know, we, we have to be very, very careful So do not rely on a teacher who teaches wrong views and behavior. Whether you enter the right path or not depends on whether your guru is properly qualified. Because we're going to follow what the guru says. If the guru eats meat, his students will eat meat. If he's a vegetarian, they're all vegetarian. God me, all like, we like sheep. Eh. So, if we're going to be sheep-like, at least we should follow a good shepherd. Right? Because if it's a bad shepherd, we are going to fall down the chasm. This again is about really assessing the qualified teacher. We have to be very, very careful. Might look very good on the outside. But you really, this is a very crucial point, um, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, because you know we have to really rely on, on the direction of the teacher and follow their example. Well, if their example is pure and beautiful Buddha activity, then that's wonderful. That inspires us to the, the best we have within us. But if not, then we are going to end up very confused and very bewildered and maybe even making a lot of negative karma thinking that we're doing right. So it's a very important point. Do not rely on a teacher who teaches wrong views and behavior. Be careful. Whether you enter the right path or not depends on whether your guru is properly qualified. Therefore, search for the right spiritual friend. Having examined him and serve, having examined him and made your, your really, yes, this is a, the perfect teacher. This is really someone who has deep understanding, whose moral conduct is, is perfect, who is somebody who really I can trust and follow, and I know that he is a genuine spiritual friend and will not lead me into any kind of moral danger. Then, serve him well 
through the three ways of pleasing the teacher. So the three ways of pleasing the teacher, again, are first through making material offerings. You know, we, we do what we can to um, support the teacher and to give them things which we think will please them. Uh, so that's the first way. And then the second way is by um, serving them in any way which is possible. You know, to be, you know, if you're their uh, assistant or if you're part of their retinue, their entourage, then to do what you can to serve them uh, in a way which will relieve them of their own, uh, you know, responsibilities for dealing with things. We can deal with it on their behalf and so forth, making everything nice for them. But the real way to serve the guru is through our practice. The, if we really want to please the guru, it's by showing that we are sincerely practicing and, and gaining some understanding. That's what will really delight the guru, not making magnificent gifts or even being, you know, serving them and taking care of them, but practicing what they teach and uh, sincerely trying to gain some understanding and realization. That is what really pleases the heart of the teacher. A genuine teacher will always be happy at the progress of, of their students. So these are the three ways to uh, serve the teacher. How are we doing? Um, okay. Avoid embroiling your mind with masses of discursive, insubstantial words or piling up ideas and things. Don't get too caught up. Keep the mind as simple as possible. I mean, there are times for discursive thinking when we can sit and think, okay, now I'm going to analyze, I'm going to think, I have these projects, I have these ideas. Now, sit and meditate, clear the mind, and then bring up the object that we need to think about and just think about it. Then the mind will be clear and that makes it so much easier to be able to get to the real point of what we're trying to think about. If our mind is all over the place and, and caught up with all sorts of muddles and and distractions and thoughts and feelings, then it's very difficult to think clearly. So if we have to make big decisions or really come to thinking and, you know, we need to really have a mind which is nice and clear. It's like if you're going to do some very complicated um, mathematical formulas, first you clear the board of all the stuff which was before, you have a nice clean board, then you look at it, and then you, you start building up your formulas. If you've already got all this stuff on, on it beforehand, you can't find where your formulas are, it's gotten completely jumbled up with all the other stuff. So to keep the mind clear, focused, attentive, open space with things appearing. Uh, so, avoid embroiling your mind with masses of discursive, insubstantial words and piling up ideas and things. You know, <laughs> some people's minds are like this. You know, sometimes I've thought that if we all had loudspeakers attached to our minds, <laughs> meditation would be very popular. <laughs> so, do not be satisfied with taking a little bit of vital instruction of teaching, which is the quintessence of the enlightened mind, and leaving it at that. 
Request from your guru the whole teaching without leaving anything out. So as much as possible, we should try to gain clear instructions so that we know really exactly what we are doing. Because especially when we are in retreat, if things come up and we haven't got guidance there, then we can waste a lot of time just trying to uh, work out what we should do or how we should do it or, you know, just a little bit of teaching is not enough. We need to see the whole picture very clearly so that we can go forward with confidence knowing what we are doing and how what is happening to us fits into the general picture. This again is why I'm saying it's very useful in the beginning to start with guided retreats because then a skillful teacher will lead the student step by step by step and they will get the whole picture and anything which comes up which uh, might be you know, a cause for confusion or not knowing should I go this way, should I go that way, with a skilled teacher they can direct you. So we can go forward with confidence. It's like in an unknown terrain, if we have a good guide, you know, we're all in the desert, how to find our way out? Well, what we need is a good guide. If we have a good guide, we know we're going in the right direction. But if we are wandering around by ourselves, um, then, uh, we, you know, we could wander around for 40 years and still not find the way out. <sighs> so, we need clear guidance and, uh, you know, really understand the map so we know where we're going and that we're going in the right direction. Because it's also very easy to go in the wrong direction. You know, maybe while we're meditating, experiences of joy and bliss and light come up and we think, wow, you know, yeah, great. You know, and, and so we, we go off in that direction. But that might be leading us away from where we're really trying to go. And so we need to have a good teacher who will keep us on track. I remember when I was uh, doing this Mahamudra course with um, Thogden Rinpoche and every day I had to go and see him. Well, well, not much was happening, but I mean, I kept trying to, you know, occasionally something happened and I thought, oh good. And I would tell him and he would look totally bored. <laughs> and so then rummaging through my mind for what else happened, I came up with some, another thing which didn't seem of much relevance, but you know, anything. And he immediately sat up and said, what did you say? And so I repeated, and he said, oh, that's what we're waiting for. So now you stop doing that and you do this. And I would never have known by myself. It didn't seem very exciting. The nice, exciting things he was bored with. <laughs> and so in this way, it's very helpful to have a skillful guide because we waste a lot of time trying to find our own tracks. If we have somebody who really knows and can see the whole terrain, then they can say, don't go to the right, go to the left. Um, Ajahn Chah, again, he said that his, some of his students complained because when they got together to discuss his instruction, with some of them he had said, you know, do this, and with others he had said, do that. And so they were very confused. He's given them opposite instruction. And he said, well, it's like if you see somebody going down a track and they're veering too much to the left, you say, go right, go right. But if they're veering too much to the right, go left, go left. And so it sounds like the opposite, but it's all just to keep them on track. So like that, it, this is why um, it's very useful to do uh, practice at the beginning uh, under a skillful teacher who can keep us on track and knows where we're supposed to be going and what is important and what is not. That gives us confidence. I realize this is completely...
according to this, it's 1725. And I think it's been 1725 for a long time. <laughs> You could be here till three o'clock. I'm still waiting for <laughs> Okay. So, therefore, it's important to know exactly what you are supposed to be doing, to, to follow the instructions very carefully, and not just to have a, a little piece, but to, to have the whole instruction so that we uh, have confidence of, of what we're doing and where we're going. Scrutinize it earnestly and resolve correctly any misunderstandings regarding the doubtful points. Through the strength of your meditative experience, deepen your conviction. Successfully integrate in your being the learning, reflection and meditation of the complete instructions, including those on avoiding pitfalls, and enhancing the practice. Thus, make sure you are entering the unerring path. It is a great loss to take bits and pieces of all kinds of teachings, renowned to be very profound, having mere intellectual understanding of them and leaving it at that, without gaining confidence or first-hand experience of any of them. So again, the scrutinize our, the teaching we receive earnestly, resolve correctly any misunderstandings regarding doubtful points. Oh, thank you, dear. Um, that we should really, if we don't understand something, we should ask. Clarify everything so that when we are practicing, we don't have doubts. Is this the right way? Is this the wrong way? Am I doing it correctly? Oh, I'm not sure. What did he say about that? Very clear. Of course, nowadays also, if you are not able to do um, a, a, a guided retreat under the instruction of an actual teacher in front of you, then you can always try YouTube. Because, I'm not joking, um, the second best is to um, carry out the uh, guided meditations of certain very qualified teachers who have put all their teaching and their, you know, they, they record their guided meditations. So one could follow that. That is not very best. Very best is to have an actual teacher. But if one doesn't have that, Many people do their retreats following the guidance of, for example, Alan Wallace or Mingyur Rinpoche or anybody who does these, um, you know, these uh, guided practices that you do, do one, then you sit and you do it, then they give you the next instruction, like that. That's the next best. Not perfect because you can't ask questions, but at least better than just sitting there by yourself and trying to make up your own meditation. So, um, scrutinize earnestly, resolve correctly any misunderstandings regarding the doubtful points. Through the strength of your meditative experience, deepen your conviction. The only way to really believe that this is the right path is to walk it. And then we see certain signposts and we say, oh yes, that's what it mentioned. Right, yes, I must be on the right track. This is very important because until we actually practice and experience, we only have intellectual uh, conviction. But intellectual conviction is not the actual thing. No matter how much we may intellectually understand, it is not the same as actual experience. The same as actual realization. But so our meditative experience will deepen our conviction. Yes, we are, our conviction about what? Yes, this is a valid path. Yes, I can do this. Yes, this is actually really working, actually. Look, hey, guess what? And that gives us more 
enthusiasm to keep going. Successively integrate in your being learning, reflection, and meditation of the complete instructions. So in Buddhism, there are three stages. The first is learning. That means we hear the instructions, we read the instructions, we take in the instructions, then we think about them. We reflect on them. We, uh, do we have any questions about this? Have we understood it properly? Are we have any doubts? We have to think about it and question it. Not just blindly accept. But do we really understand this? If we have any doubts, then we should find someone to clear our doubts. This is a very important stage. First we hear it or we read it and study it. Then we go and we think about it. What does that mean to me? What is this? Is this right? Does this make sense or not? Think, reflect, question. Then, as one of my lamas said, then we become it. In other words, we practice, we meditate. Meditation in Tibetan is the word gom. And gom means to become accustomed to something. Actually, it doesn't mean to meditate. It means to become accustomed to something. We become used to it. We, we, we become it eventually. So, we have the, we hear about the practice. We think about it and, and try to understand how it is done. Then we go away and we make use of it, we practice it, we become it. It's like food, you know, you, you see the food, you read about the food, you know, with a the recipe, then we gather the ingredients and we create the food, then we have to eat it. If we don't eat it, it won't nourish us. We may know all the chemical ingredients and all the good qualities and all the vitamins and minerals that this food contains, but it's not going to benefit us until we eat it. Once we eat it, we become it, because the food merges with our body. So it's like that. So, successfully integrate in your being the learning, reflection, and meditation of the complete instructions, which will always include those on avoiding pitfalls and how to enhance the practice. So in any um, instruction, like on Mahamudra, there are always sections which tells you things which you should avoid and be careful about, and other ways to give a boost to the practice, little hints for uh, helping your practice along. So, all of this we should know. We should have an idea of the, the complete picture so that we can integrate this advice into our practice and not waste time. Thus, make sure you are entering the unerring path. That means the unmistaken path. It is a great loss to take bits and pieces of all kinds of teachings renowned to be very profound, having mere intellectual understanding of them and leaving it at that, without gaining first-hand experience in any of them. So we read about Zen and we read about Theravada and we read about Vipassana and we read about Dzogchen and we read about Mahamudra, and we read about all these different tantric practices, and it's all very wonderful, and we don't do any of it. Or we do a weekend course on Yamantaka, and then wonder, oh, I'm not enlightened yet. It is much more essential to take one practice and practice it. It encompasses all of them. But if we take a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other and try to put it together like a kind of buffet, 
doesn't work. We just get indigestion. Very important. Yes, we can look. In this day and age, we have such an incredible opportunity to see all the different spectrums of spirituality which exist in this world at this time. Never before have they been so accessible. And even in the Buddhist world, we have so now we have, a, you know, the whole spectrum of Buddhist practice within the Buddhist world. But we can't do everything. So, it's important to have a clear understanding of a practice which feels suitable for oneself. Not expecting that it's immediately going to work. Knowing that it's practice. Any practice takes time. They say to become a professional musician, one has to practice for at least 30,000 hours. That's a lot of practice. Just to twiddle your fingers. What to speak of mastering the mind. So just because we do a weak retreat and we're not enlightened, forget it. It takes time. It takes application. The important thing is in general, to find a practice which really speaks to oneself, that one has confidence in, that one can find a qualified teacher, and then do it. And then one can, you know, certain other traditions have certain other aspects which are useful. One can, you know, add those, but still the central core is one's practice, whichever it might be. Stick to it. Keep digging that same hole, not making lots of little holes all over the, the desert. Underneath, there is uh, groundwater. But if we just keep digging little holes, then oh, the, it's still sand. Try over there. Uh, it's still dry. Try over there. Then we're never going to die. But if we keep digging and digging, eventually the sand will become damp, <coughs> which is encouraging. And then if we keep digging, it gets damper. And then suddenly, whoosh, like that. And any of those holes would have done it. But we need to stick to one hole. Uh, okay. Once the instructions have merged with your being, you will see the central topic of all Dharma teachings, whether imparted directly, indirectly, or by their own strength, have been taught with a common criteria and purpose. That's what I'm saying. Once we really get to the water source, we recognize all those other holes could have got to the water source. They, they all are equally valid, but we only need one. It's not that ours is the only way and everybody else is inferior, even in spiritual traditions, not just Buddhism. Any of them, if they keep digging, will get there because it's the nature of our being. It's not just that Buddhists have Buddha nature. Everybody has Buddha nature. Mosquitoes have Buddha nature. Camels have Buddha nature. It's not, you know, copyright Buddhists. We all have Buddha nature. So therefore, anybody, if they are on a genuine spiritual path, can discover true nature, of course. They all call it by different names. But names are just a label which we're sticking on space. Labels are all part of our conceptual thinking mind. They are not ultimate reality. So don't get caught up in labels. So whether they have been taught with common criteria and purpose, that's the different paths or their outcomes are all compatible. 
the teachings you were given by your root guru are in accordance with your own faculties and particular fortune. Consider them all sufficient, merge them all into one point and put them into practice. They will then be most effective. So exactly that. I mean, even within, um, for example, when I was with my Lama Kanta Rinpoche, then there were uh, four Western nuns. Somehow or other, he had the karma to have nuns, no monks. Um, so one was American, one was Dutch, one was Swiss, and myself. And we would go together to get um, various empowerments. But he would always give the teachings individually. And afterwards, when we sat and compared, he often told us quite different things. I mean, for example, one practice we had to do, there were 120 deities, all with 12 arms and four heads, and oh, it was, and all these 120 deities, one was here, and one was, all these mandalas of 120 deities. There, there were about 2,000 something deities. And we had to visualize them all, right? And, um, so my friends, he said, oh, just see it vaguely, just get the feeling for it. So then when I went to see him, I said, so just see it vaguely, get the feeling. No, no, no. See it very accurately, as clearly as you can. <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. So like this, we, we would find, he would teach each one of us individually and give different instructions. And also, like, sometimes I would say, you know, what can I do, Rinpoche? And he would say, what do you want to do? And I would suggest something and go, hmm. And then he would suggest something else. And I'd say, wow, yes. And I would run to my friends and say, Rinpoche says I should do so and so. And they went, ooh. Oh, well, I hope he doesn't tell us to do that. And I said, well, if that's your reaction, then he won't. And he never did. So that's the point. The point is that each one of us has different potential, different karmic imprints, different, you know, we each have our own way. And, but once we are directed, then we should merge our being with that and become that practice. And really, that will fulfill our potential. And it doesn't matter what the practice is. All of them will lead back to the source. But different people have different karmic propensities. And so different people are suited for different practices, that's all. So this text is about meditation, mainly. But of course, in order to fulfill our spiritual being, in order to attain enlightenment, we have to cultivate all the paramita. That means generosity, ethics, patience, uh, enthusiastic effort, meditation, and wisdom. But the Buddha said we start with generosity. Generosity means open hands, open heart. Now, this, this group who have organized this function here, for which you are, are all sitting, these Dharma friends of Israel, they rely on your generosity. They are not charging you. In, in America, one of the big problems is that Buddhism talks about, you know, contentment with little and, and not being too ambitious materially. And so people, you know, try to hone down their, their needs and, and so forth. But then the, the actual Dharma events are so expensive. They can't afford it. So the poor old Buddhists can't go to their own Buddhist events because it's so expensive. And here, really, I mean, in Asia in general and Israel here also, we see that they are trying to bring the real principles of Dharma into being as much as they can. Because it's not easy, you have to rent halls, you have to, you know, facilitate everything and yet they are trying to do this, relying on the generosity of the people here who are participating. Otherwise they could charge you a lot of money and then, I don't know, you'd all complain. 
And it's not, the Dharma should be free, is the idea. But at the same time, generosity is a wonderful paramita. So if you want the Dharma to flourish, you have to support it materially, not just by your attendance. So please, what you can do, please do. The beauty of dana, of giving, is that nobody's looking to see what you do, how much you give, how much you don't give. If you don't give, you don't give, that's fine. If you give one shekel, you give one shekel. Nobody's judging you. Nobody's watching to see how much you're going to offer. But those of you who are able, those of you who can, however little, however much, please do offer. Because this is helping the Dharma to flourish. It's not for me, it's for the Dharma. And so, please don't forget, just because they are not, you know, selling tickets, it doesn't mean that there are no expenses to be covered and that they are not in need of your help and your generosity. So, please bear that in mind and, um, and go to lunch. And I think half past one, then Sunma Aileen will be here to answer your questions. And we will start again on the, the text at three o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>